G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Uh, now most of you have had a little bit of a chance to sleep on the trade period after it all came to a uh, exciting climax yesterday. But for me, I'm obviously here in the UK so the time zones are all different and since the trade period ended a few hours ago, I've just been compiling some, uh, some analysis I guess and taking a look at how each and every single club did in the 2023 trade period. So the purposes of this video is to retrospectively just look back at the net ins and outs for each club, their draft position, and generally weigh up how well I think they did. Assessing how a given club has done in a respective trade period is a little bit more nuanced than it used to be. We have to consider their strategy, where they're at from a list position. It's not as simple as net in versus net out, um, but it's also a little bit more complicated these days with um, future trading because we have to consider the draft position they're in is, is often due to how well they did in the last year's trade period and then there's also next year's picks to consider in terms of how much value they actually get out of given deals but we're gonna have a crack so uh, I'm gonna crack through it alphabetically I have called this video winners and losers um, I don't necessarily think that's the best way to look at it I have called it that because it's a snappy title but I will be making assessments as to how well I think a, a each club has done so I'm gonna go through all 18 we can certainly make assessments as to who we think uh, won out of their trade period and who was particularly successful but I'm not sure if I'm a huge believer in you know labeling a club or a loser out of a trade period when it's just happened except Fremantle they sucked so let's start with the Adelaide Footy Club uh, they got Chris Burgess in this trade period and they lost Tom Day Day 3 uh, free agency and Shane McAdam also joined the Melbourne Football Club so just looking at that as a net uh, obviously a couple of Borderline best 22 players. I know McAdam didn't play a lot of football this year. I don't know how much of that was to injury and stuff like that, but um, probably on the fringe of that 22 anyway. Uh, and Tom Dode, you know, other than his ACL, is a pretty key player. So to only get Chris Burgess in from a playing point of view, it's uh, it's not a massive win, uh, but their draft position is fairly strong. So they hold three picks in the top 20, picks 10, 14, and 20. And what is also helpful as well, that they held all of their future selections and have an extra second round pick next year. So what do they try and do this trade period? Well, they went after Clayton Oliver at first and uh, and then Harrison Petty as a means to look for some mature players to replace the outgoing ones. And obviously they came up a little bit short, only getting Burgess, who is a proven VFL player, but far from a pure uh, proven AFL player, that's for sure. Look, there's been a bit of a suggestion that Burgess is going to play back. That was one question mark I had on them. I think uh, from a playing list, best 22 point of view, I think adding a key defender would have been um, really handy for the position they're in. And I, I don't really know how to assess Burgess as a key defender, uh, but either way, it's a speculative one. And so I'd say... Given where they're at, I think Adelaide are pushing up the ladder now. I think they're going to be aiming for finals this year. Not a massively successful trade period, but again, if they draft well, then um, they may look back on this as a successful one. But at the moment, going into next year in the short term, I don't, wouldn't say they've improved their list. Then you've got the Brisbane Lions, who gained Tom Dode and Brandon Ryan from Hawthorne on deadline day. Uh, and they lost Tom Fullerton as a depth sort of key forward ruck. And Jack, Jack Gunston obviously uh, wanted to go back to Hawthorne as well. I think if you look at the ins of Dode and Brandon Ryan, particularly Dode, when he is fit, obviously he's going to miss a large chunk of next year with that ACL injury. I think he has the potential to be a really key player for them. And he signed him through uh, free agency as well. So that, you know, that was probably made with the vision of replacing Mark. Adams and uh, Harris Andrew and Jack Payne are back there in the back line so he becomes that third tall I think that's a pretty good mix that they've added there uh, Gunston turns into Ryan and Ryan's a bit of a younger option obviously not as proven a goal kicker but towards the end of the year there was probably a little doubt as to how they could get Gunston back into their side obviously he didn't quite come up for the grand final so maybe this one is for the best but that kind of hinges on how well Ryan goes either way for the position they're in you know they never held a first rounder this year they traded it for Dunkley last year and their future picks uh, they, they probably want to bolster that uh, going forward and they can still do that because there's still pick trading until November 10 and then there's of course the live draft as well with Levi Ashcroft on the horizon that will be a focus for them going forward. Carlton got in Elijah Hollands at the expense of Zach Fisher and Paddy Dow uh, so a relatively quiet one from the Blues who obviously made a prelim this year um, but they did split a pick nicely I think to get two picks in the second round so I think it was what was 17 became 21 and 25 that is now 22 and 28 I think but it's considered an even draft pull around that range uh, as for the players they got in it was kind of just a shuffling of depth um, Hollands replaces Fisher and Dow and 
Sure, two players is probably better than one, but um, they're all kind of speculative at this point. So uh, it remains to be seen what happens there. But I don't think it was a great loss for them. I think this was a slow and steady trade period after a big season. Still a lot of young talent with whom they can see organic improvement. There's still a lot of organic potential with the players they've got on their list. And I think Holland's also has potential. So um, yeah, slow and steady for Carlton. The Pies were up to their next in it uh, this time again, the second here in a row. Uh, But this time, less players made their way to Collingwood. It was just Lockie Shules and uh, Jack Ginevan obviously left alongside Taylor Adams. A couple of surprise exits there for the Collingwood Footy Club. Now, the upgrade of Ginevan to Shules is the best 22 improvement. I think Lockie Shules is a better player than Ginevan right now. Uh, So I think in the here and now, that is a positive move. Uh, the Adams one is a blow, but I don't know. There's really much they could do about that. He seemed it was it was Adams driven, and uh, I presume that was based around mid- midfield minutes, amongst other things. The question then becomes: Do they have the midfield support to replace Taylor Adams? Well, there's a few untried players at Collingwood there. Finlay McRae might get a, an opportunity now in that midfield. Um, there's also uh, potentially Ed Allen, who they took in the first round of last year's draft. So this will create opportunities. Adams was 30. So personally, I think uh, I think they'll cover that just fine. They did trade out their future first for next year. But they did replace it with Hawthorne's future second, which in theory might not be that far behind their own future first. Then we had Essendon, who were big players in this year's trade period. They got Xavier Dersmo, Jade Gresham, Todd Goldstein, and Ben Mackay uh, through a combination of free agency and one trade with Xavier Dersma there. Uh, they lost Massimo D'Ambrosio and Brennan Zirk Thatcher, so at the expense of two players. Their picks, they've, they've held on to their first round draft pick and their second round draft pick in both this year and next year. So to bring in that quantity of players and improve their best 22, I would argue all four of those are probably going to start in their best 22 as well. I think that is a, is a really big plus. None of them are absolute A graders. I think Gresham and Dersma are quite dynamic players as well. At the expense of Zerk Thatcher, they've got Ben Mackay, who's ready-made, and I don't know what the difference in quality really is between them. Maybe Zerk Thatcher had a bit more upside, but they've got an clear um, you know, directive to try and improve their best 22 for a, uh, a surge up the ladder next year. That's the Brad Scott mentality, clearly, because he sort of did similar sort of uh, moves at, at North Melbourne to be competitive in the short term as well. But to hold on to all their draft picks, I'd say this is a pretty much a very A-plus performance from Essendon in this trade period. Improved the best 22, hold on to their draft picks, didn't really lose anyone of massive note. Well done, Essendon. Then you've got Fremantle, who um, surprisingly didn't bring anyone in this trade period. I thought we would see that on the horizon with a couple of trade requests. They did, of course, lose Liam Henry, Lockie Shules to Victoria, and Joel Hamling also joined the Sydney Footy Club. That one, a little bit less consequential, you'd think. So it was an intriguing strategy by Fremantle here, clearly opting to trade into next year's draft, not this year's for, uh, draft. In isolation, did they get value for the picks. Well, Liam Henry is a former top 10 pick and um, what did they get? A future second for him? I think that future second currently sits at pick 32. So in isolation, not a great deal, but what they have done is traded heavily into next year's round and we've talked about a potential strategy uh, where they're probably going to target um, you know, ready-made players through the trade period next year. Logan McDonald is one that has come to mind. But when you consider as well their draft position is not great this year, we also have to take into context they did trade heavily for Luke Jackson last year as well, which is a byproduct on their draft position this year, of course. Um, but three first-round draft picks does set them up nicely. I do think there is an issue with Fremantle with, with losing ready-made players and not replacing them. We saw them lose seven last year. They've lost three this year. Schultz and Henry more damaging than Hamling, who hasn't played a lot of football. But for a team that is about to plot a big move up the ladder, you'd think that would be their internal expectation. I did expect them to bring in someone ready-made, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Geelong had a pretty quiet uh, trade period, you'd have to say. No one came into that list, and Asaba Radaglia left the club. They retained uh, their pick eight. They gained pick 25. They didn't have a uh, second rounder previously. They think that went to Gold Coast as part of the Bows deal. No, it didn't, actually. They must have traded that previously. So definitely a quiet one comparatively compared to last year. Obviously, they had three former first-rounders join their list, um, in addition to uh, Jai Clark at pick seven. So I think there's a clear regeneration strategy here which along they were just prepared to sit tight take the couple of draft picks and move on GWS also had a pretty quiet trade period no one joined that football club but they did lose Matthew Flynn we do know as well that they hold two first round picks this year on account of losing Hopper and Taranto forget exactly which one is which but I think it's the Taranto pick actually now that I think about it but holding 7 and 16 is a strong draft position uh, there was some suggestion that they tried for pick one I don't think they even made an attempt as it happened uh, but when you think about Matthew Flynn the loss not really 
too consequential for him on the basis that Kieran Briggs really um, made a big name for himself as a young ruckman of the competition this year, and they still got Braden Pru. So Flynn was uh, a little bit excess to requirements. They did go for Himmelberg, and there was a bit of a sniff around Arazia Fantasia, but um, on Himmelberg, the Crows decided he was a required player. They couldn't source a replacement. And of course, uh, well, actually with Fantasia, I actually don't know what happened there because he is still out of contract and could still get there as a delisted free agent because he hasn't been traded anywhere. Sorry guys, I'm just gonna pause the video there for one moment to bring you an important message from Druzy's Athlete Academy. Now, as we wrap up the 2023 season, it's time to map out your goals for next season. Now, if you're a young footballer or general athlete, actually, your coach may have highlighted areas for improvement going into next year, such as adding muscle mass, improving your running ability, or enhancing your explosiveness. Now, you probably know where you roughly wanna be by the end of preseason, but you're probably unsure about the most effective way to get there. Now, helpfully, Druzy has three years experience working with a elite level footballers. As a result, he's learned and applied strength and conditioning strategies that will help deliver concrete results. Now, these results that you're gonna get go beyond just mere numbers, you know, superficial stuff like increasing your bench press or trimming a couple of seconds off your 2KM time trial. The methods that you get through the Druzy's Athlete Academy are actually tailored to your specific needs as an athlete. Now, beyond these superficial quantifiable gains, the feedback that the athletes at Druzy's Athlete Academy often give are that their training has actually translating in their game going to another level. Some of the feedback has been that people are able to tackle with more force or confidently break away from contests, they're able to kick further and being stronger in marking contests. Now you know where you want to be by the end of preseason. Druzy has the experience and knowledge and results to get you where you want to be. Now there's a limited time offer through Druzy's Athlete Academy where there are 10 different free one week trials. So essentially all you have to do to express interest in this is go find Drew's Athlete Academy on Instagram and DM him the message free preseason. I'll leave the information of how to contact Drewzy in the description of this video. So these one week trials are fantastic because obviously with no strings attached, you can experience the program risk free. Take action today, start building the foundations for a really strong next season. And if you do end up going through a program for Drewzy's Athlete Academy, remember to use the code TRUE4020 for 20% off. Thanks guys, we'll get back to the video now. Gold Coast had a very productive off-season, you'd say. Uh, no one arrived in the club and they cleared a bit of cap space. And this is a little bit of a product of um, overpaying some players to either get them to come over or stay. And two of those were Marby Ochoa and Elijah Hollands. And then Chris Burgess as well. I don't know how much he was paid. But again, clearing the books, clearing some list space. And they got all their academy picks. And they actually traded well for picks this year as well, acquiring uh, 10, 17 and a future first from the Bulldogs. That is a great deal for pick four, considering they didn't really need it. I would argue this is a very successful trade period for the Gold Coast Suns in, turn, in terms of achieving their aims. Uh, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that they are fortunate to have the academy system, which is what's going to give them a great off-season. So while they did well in terms of executing their strategy, they are kind of being gifted players for their academy. But anyway. Then you get Hawthorne, who were very active in this year's trade period and probably had a pretty successful one. So they got Jack Ginevan, Jack Gunston, Mabio Chol, and Massimo D'Ambrosio. At least three of those will start in their best 22. Dan's, Dan Brozio, I'm not too sure, but I presume he's a chance. Uh, then they lost Brockman, Kaczynski, and Brandon Ryan late as well on the trade period. So they lost one best 22 player. Tyler Brockman was, was at least around the mark. I'm not sure if he was entrenched in that 22, but he played a hand, uh, quite a few games for them. And uh, they also lost two depth key forwards. But they did replace him with two key forwards anyway. Jack Gunston, admittedly on the older side, comes in and will certainly improve that team for next year. I would have thought he's not really looking like declining too much. And Marvin your troll as well is a well a proven goal kicker at AFL level. This offseason represented a clear look to maturity to try and consolidate that best 22 for finals push. That's the way I read it. They weren't really shopping their top picks unless it allowed them to trade up for pick one, which was Harley Reid, of course. But you get the sense that they're looking to plug some um, holes now. Then they're happy with uh, some of the drafting they've done in recent years. So productive from Hawthorne. I'm intrigued to see how it works out for them. Melbourne were an interesting player in this year's uh, trade period. Obviously, um, it started with a bit of talk around uh, Clayton Oliver leaving. I've obviously retained him. Obviously, I hope he's doing well for a start as well. Um, who arrived? They got Jack Billings, Tom Fullerton, and Shane McAdam. They lost Grundy, Harms, and Jordan. So they've offloaded a few fringe players that weren't really going to be getting a look in anyway. Um, well, all three of them really. Grundy was sidelined as a second ruck. Um, that experiment failed and they gave up on it already. Harms and Jordan weren't really getting regular games and were told to look elsewhere. What they did do is get a young prospect in Fullerton, uh, who's a key forward ruck, who's probably better suited to the role Grundy was meant to play anyway. And Billings, I still think, has a lot of potential to... 
maybe not a lot of potential, but he's got the potential to come into that Melbourne side in a good system and produce because I think there is talent there. And similarly, Shane McAdam, I think, is a pretty handy little small forward. So probably just optimize their list. And what else they did was uh, they consolidated their draft picks. They had a good draft hand going into this. They've consolidated down to two really strong picks in 6 and 11, which may be part of a Harley Reid bid. Who knows? It's, uh, time will tell on that one. But either way, if they just take the two picks, which I believe they are, 6 and 11 is a great draft hand. So I think Melbourne did pretty well. I think they executed on all their aims this offseason. Then there's North Melbourne, who, uh, again, were pretty active, and we'll talk about who they got in first. That was Dylan Stevens, Zach Fisher, uh, Bigoa Nguyen, uh, who I might just call Biggie now, and Toby Pink as well, who signed as a delisted free agent. I think that's relevant to this conversation. So they lost Ben Mackay and Todd Goldstein. Um, this one is, is tricky to assess exactly how well they did in terms of uh, their own efforts, but let's start with, um, firstly, I like Fisher and Stevens as uh, two ins that will improve their best 22, and it kind of rounds out a group of four players, mature players that they've brought in to try and improve their best 22, make it a bit more competitive because North Melbourne has been below the bar of competitive over the last two seasons. Stevens and Fisher, I think, are two players that have the potential to improve their team and add something different. Then there's also Logan and Tucker, obviously, they got last year. So they're ticking that box of improving their competitiveness. Um, of course, they did lose a Ruckman in Goldstein. I do see that they have earmarked Coleman Jones as potentially playing more Ruck next year. That was one query I had. One thing I'll say is that the key defensive options, I don't think they've really gone hard enough to recruit anyone that's probably going to improve their best 22. So Ben Mackay, even though he probably wasn't worth band one compensation in terms of how good he actually is. Regardless, you know, he's still going to be a big step, well, it's still going to be a big step down from Mackay to Biggie here and Toby Pink. Both of them are very unproven at AFL level. Now, I think the, what they're probably going to run with is, you know, Core and Combin. I think I've been reading they might play him uh, as that key back. And Logue is injured with an ACL and will come back into the side. But I probably would have thought maybe more of an experienced stopgap option like a Dougal Howard or a Tom Cleary could have been of some use to them. But that aside, obviously they go into the draft with a really strong hand in a good position to potentially trade for pick one. We'll see what happens there, of course. Am I going to give them heaps of credit for the position they're in? Uh, no, sorry, North Melbourne fans. I'm not, not to sound salty, but I'm trying to assess how well I think North Melbourne did. And a lot of this, this draft position that they've got uh, is a result of getting band one compensation for a player leaving and, of course, being awarded some priority picks. Now, they did trade those priority picks, and I think that was savvy because that will um, remove the risk of the AFL taking it off them later because they were subject to review in 12 months' time. So that gave them some impetus to uh, trade the picks this year, and they've put themselves in a good position to some extent. But, again, they kind of benefited from a few handouts there. So, overall, I think, you know, they've... They're in a position to springboard into an improved season next year, but um, they definitely had some help. Then we've got Port Adelaide, another big player in this offseason. They recruited Radigalia, Soldo, Jordan Sweet, and Zerk Thatcher. So two key backs and two rucks that will likely all feature in their best 22, at least that's what they're saying, uh, at the expense of Xavier Dersma. Now, they only hold pick 73 in this year's draft. So that is a bizarre position to be in. All four probably will play next year. Sweet and Soldo, I don't know if that's an ideal one and two combo. I don't know. I feel like both of them are both better suited to being number one ruck. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see Radaglia, Zerk Thatcher become an important part of that back line and we see Soldo thrive as a number one ruck. And I wouldn't be surprised if Sweet thinking after a little while, like, why did I come here? Because I think I'm going to get pushed out of the side again. I, 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 that's one question I have on it. But overall, you know, the, the power have shown a real tendency to favor mature players when they believe they're in the mix for finals and beyond. And they've done that again. My only hesitation here is now that's three drafts in a row that they don't hold a first round draft pick in. And that's getting into West Coast areas. An important caveat to that, though, is that two of those first rounders did become Jason Horn Francis, who is only 20 years old. So they're not in a bad position like West Coast were. But there is a clear disregard for the draft three years in a row, and they will start next year's draft with the least draft points as well, and in effectively the worst draft hand. So Port Adelaide have taken some risks. They've bolstered their best 22. They've filled some gaps. Um, will it really see them ascend up the ladder? I'm not too sure, but maybe it's given them a bit more sustainability. Then you've got Richmond. Uh, they recruited Jacob Kaczynski, and they lost Biggie, Biggie uh, Bigo and Yuan, and Ivan Soldo as well. Now, uh, they were a little bit hamstrung going into this year because they have traded picks out of the this year's draft for Hopper and Taranto last year. So their flexibility to make real big moves was limited and it's an interesting time. We don't really know to what extent they're at a crossroads with their list. I think they probably are and are going to struggle
struggle, but at the very least, they've added a potential partner for Tom Lynch in that forward line in Kaczynski, who has shown some good form at AFL level before. They've lost Soldo, but they do have Samson Ryan, who is a good young ruck of the competition as well. Like I said, I probably would have liked to see a little bit more movement to, to get them up the draft order, because I think what they need desperately is some access to, to some good talent, but I do acknowledge their hands are tied. So we'll see what happens. I know that they've got a, a couple of extra picks in next year's draft. What do they get? They got Fremantle's uh, future second and Port Adelaide's future fourth. That gives them potential to either trade up next year or potentially live trade this year as well if they get a prospect that they like. So we'll wait and see on Richmond, but quiet and, and understandably quiet. Then you got the Saints who added Liam Henry and Paddy Dow at the expense of Gresham, Billings, and Caulfield. Uh, I think they offloaded three players that used to be quite highly rated at the Saints um, for various reasons. None of it's really come on. Caulfield was injured. Billings didn't really fulfill his potential. Uh, I still think Gresham is a half-decent player. So what they have done, though, is refresh their list in a way and cleared some space. And um, what they did need to do was regenerate their midfield a little bit, add some support. I think Liam Henry is a pretty good get for him. They needed some outside run. They got it. Paddy Dow, I, I don't really know if he's got too much to offer at AFL level. Maybe that's just through my own ignorance, but they did need midfield depth. So technically ticking a box there. They've also still got a pretty solid draft hand. They've got uh, you know a pick 13 and a pick 21, which came for Gresham. So a solid draft hand. Their third pick's at 40. They're probably going to take the three picks and uh, add to what I think is a nice mix of young players that they've added to their list in recent years to give the Saints some credit. Overall, productive. Um, it'll be interesting to see how well Billings and Gresham go at their new clubs because if they do thrive, that will probably make this look a little bit worse for St Kilda. Then you've got the Sydney Swans and they were productive as well, adding four players that uh, will be in and around the best 22, you'd think. James Jordan, Brody Grundy, Joel Hamling and Taylor Adams. So two clear f um, gaps for the Swans this year was their ruckman. They needed a number one ruck. Hickey retired. They added Brody Grundy, who as a number one ruck has the potential to be pretty good. Doesn't need to be an elite, but if he's a solid B grade ruck, that's a win for him. Joel Hamling, again, he hasn't played a lot of football, but they desperately needed to key back. Is he the best key back they could have got on the market? I'm not too sure, but Sydney do have a habit of taking players from other clubs and improving them, even at their older age. So we'll see what happens there. And then Taylor Adams and Jordan, that was another need for him. Some midfield depth, obviously Callum Mills' is injury, but I think regardless, they were still going to be on the market for it. Uh, Taylor Adams is still a good player at 30. James Jordan has uh, more, he's a premiership player. So there's some potential there. Importantly as well, they still hold a first round draft pick in this year, as well as some picks in the third round. Uh, probably traded that second rounder because they're probably going to match a bid for Caden Cleary in this year's draft. They also got one of North Melbourne's priority picks next year. So I think Sydney have done very well. Then you got the West Coast Eagles. I have done a little bit of a video on this already, so I'll be brief with this one. We got Tyler Brockwin and Matthew Flynn and didn't lose anyone. Clearly everyone wants to stay at uh, what's happening at West Coast this year. It's a great place to be, I'm sure. Now, but in all seriousness, um, tick some boxes in the sense you got some uh, mature, ready-made players. We were probably looking at that considering how uncompetitive we were. Um, they're still in the right age brackets for the short term and potentially the medium to long term, particularly Brockman, who's only 20. Um, we did need a pressure forward as well. So uh, if I could offer any criticism for them, um, and maybe this is being harsh, but I, I'd like to have seen a little bit more urgency from West Coast to improve their draft position. We've seen their second rounder, which in theory should have been pick 19, is probably going to be about 28 on draft night. And I've made that comment before. I would have liked to see some creative moves to maybe move that up, you know, potentially using future picks, not necessarily our future first, but um, some sort of intention to improve our draft position because it's not the most inspiring draft position to have despite uh, having pick, tw uh, pick one rather. This makes me think though that they are seriously considering trading pick one. Now, I think it's going to be at a steep cost, but I think there is a genuine hope, hope from a West Coast point of view to get pick two and three. I don't think it's going to happen, but I think that might be what is holding up any other moves. They're still genuinely considering it. They certainly haven't shut the door on it. And also we have until November 10 um, and then also live trades for them to improve their draft position. So solid enough from West Coast. And finally, the Western Bulldogs. I actually think these guys might be kind of an unsung hero of this trade period. They're, I don't think they've been talked about a lot, but we'll start with what they got. They got James Harms and Nick Caulfield and they lost Jordan Sweet, their backup Ruckman. Now, uh, Harms comes into boss to some midfield depth, probably going to play some games, you think. Caulfield has some potential uh, as an injury-prone player, but even if those guys don't come on, I think both were worth the um, the risk. Where they really won this, this trade period, not necessarily they didn't win it as the number one team, but where I think they did really well was they traded a lot for a pick four, which is now five from the Gold Coast Suns. It was 10, 17, and a future first, right? It seems really steep 
on the face value of it. But what the Bulldogs have is a father-son in Jordan Croft in this year's draft, and he's likely to be a top 12 pick at the moment. So what that pick four gives them, or pick five, gives them a chance to take a pick before that. So they're going to add two first-round draft picks, a top five pick as well. So when you do the math on it, right, they have picks five, 48, and 50, and plus heaps of others in the 50s. Five becomes, you know, maybe Nick Watson. And the, all the 40s picks and 50s picks become Jordan Croft. That's two first round picks. They go into next year without a future first, sure. But what they've essentially done is trade that future first for pick five this year. That has worked out tremendously well for them. Again, I can't use the caveat of good luck for North Melbourne. They had some outside external help, obviously. In the Bulldogs case, equally, the father-son is not really through their own um, effort or merit, so to speak. So there is a little bit of luck here from the Bulldogs, but I still think they've done really well to trade into the position they're in and add two top 12 picks this year at the expense of a um, maybe top 10 pick next year. But anyway, guys, that is my analysis of all 18 clubs. Let me know in the comments section what you agree with and disagree with. I, uh, I know that I'm probably going to get told off by North fans for being salty. I didn't mean to come across as salty, but I'm trying to be level-headed about things and I didn't think heaping praise on North Melbourne was quite the right response, to be honest. But anyway, I appreciate your support, guys. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.